First off, thanks everybody for being here. Um, my name, as I said, is Laura Michaels. I'm at the MCW. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the goals of care in ET. I want to focus on some of the clinical questions that face you, and those are clinical questions that we can continue to discuss in our breakout sessions as well, and what information is necessary for people to make informed decisions about whether or not they need to be treated, how they need to be monitored, and whether and when they do, do decide how to um, sort of decide w between therapies. So I thought I'd take a clinical case and I will disclose to you this is a little bit of a mishmash of two patients, but um, I felt like it really started by walking through this whole thing with a case, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the things that she faced. So she's 32, she had psoriasis and an episode of a depression following a miscarriage. Um, the miscarriage was in her mid-20s. Uh, she was treated with antidepressants. She got better um, maybe a year after that and has been off of antidepressants since that time. She goes to a routine um, physical exam and she reports this severe itching and pain in her feet and legs. She acts as a docent um, for the architectural society in her town. And when she walks or is up for or does any brisk exercise, she gets this extremely painful redness in her feet that she says is a rash. And after a while, it goes away, but it lasts a good 10 to 15 minutes. She gets a CBC and she's shown to have um, a hemoglobin of 12, which is normal, platelets of 1.2 million, a white count of 9.3, and her manual differential, so when we look at her blood smear underneath the microscope, it shows abnormal forms. So this woman, you know, in my office, I would say, well, it looks like you may have ET, but really an accurate diagnosis requires being a little bit more careful than that, and we have to go through some key steps. And I always write down when I meet the patients that first we need to know the diagnosis, then we need to know the risk that that diagnosis poses to you, and then we have to choose treatment. And it always has to go in that order. Diagnosis, risk, treatment. Because your treatment is going to depend on what that foundation of diagnostics and the understanding of what dangers both the disease and the treatments pose to you. So when you're thinking about the diagnosis, everybody with a concern for essential thrombocythemia needs to have a history, which she did a physical exam. Now, notably, when she was in my office, I couldn't see this anything going wrong with her feet, and she wasn't having any of these symptoms. It's like taking your car to the mechanic when you go there, the lights work, right? Um, but so she wasn't having, but she did describe it to me, and she had some pictures on her phone, and the pictures just showed some red feet. We did a lab work, including a blood smear, and we looked at this thing called an erythry erythropoietin level. The erythropoietin level is the level of the hormone that the body's making that sort of jump starts the bone marrow, the red blood cells, and hers was a little bit low. We looked at her iron levels, and we did a symptom assessment. This is something that Dr. Messa has um, sort of pioneered. And this is a graph, or a sheet that you can print out from the computer that goes over some very specific symptoms related to um, myeloproliferative disorders. And when my patients come in, they get this sheet and they write them down. And then over time, we can sort of see what's been happening with them. And it's relatively objective. And that way, we can keep track of what's happening with their symptoms. We did something to rule out a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia by testing for BCR able. This is absolutely essential for anybody who says they may have a, who might have a MPN, and that's because this disease, chronic myelogenous leukemia, is treated in a different manner, and it can masquerade as MPN quite a bit. So this is essential. I perform a bone marrow biopsy and aspirate on everyone. Uh, who has a possible myeloproliferative disorder. And that's because, according to the World Health Organization, one of my obligations as a doctor is to rule out that this woman has early myelofibrosis as opposed to ET. Early myelofibrosis behaves more viciously, and it's something we need to watch for. So in my practice, everybody, ET, PV, myelofibrosis, has a bone marrow biopsy. And we do JAK mutation testing. If the JAK mutation testing is negative, and this refers to the mutations that Dr. Gottlieb just talked about, if that's negative, then I go on to do the others. And that's because JAK is most common, and I do the secondary levels if the JAK is negative. 
Now, sometimes I also look for this condition called von Willebrand syndrome. We'll talk about that in a second. I talk about fertility history and their wishes for future fertility. And I talk about depression history, again, because this matters when I'm thinking about treatment. And it matters to the overall quality of life of this patient. So this lady went through a bone marrow biopsy in a lab workup. Her bone marrow showed features of essential thrombocythemia. She was negative for the JAK mutation, and she was positive for the Cal mutation, okay? And this is a, about 40% of people are positive for Cal if they have ET, um, and JAK is about 50%. So we use this to talk about the next step, which is ris risks to her disease. So in essential thrombocytoma, Cythemia, 50 to 60 percent of patients have this JAK mutation. Cal R is 20 to 25 percent, and then this MPL is about 2 to 3 percent. Now, 15 percent, 10 to 15 percent fall in this um, triple negative, which means that none of those three are, n are positive. You can do additional testing. Um, again, this is through groups, either a genetic profile through the hospital you're being seen at or perhaps through something like Foundation One, a, a company that does these. And you can get more, uh, a, a wider one. But if you just look at these three key ones, JAK2, CalR, and MPL, about 10 to 15% of people with ET will have none of those. There are two different subtypes of CalR. One is called a type 2 and type 1. And this is getting a little bit into the weeds. But when we talk about the good risk features of CalR and ET, we're talking about the type 1. So you just want to make sure that your doctor knows which subtype of CalR you have. Um, so what does that, that all mean? Well, there are ways that we've used studies and looked back at patients with ET who are CalR positive and patients with ET who are JAK2 positive. And they have different clinical features. And that's probably because the way that that mutation happens influences how the stem cell works and influences what happens with the blood counts. So for example, patients that are CalR positive tend to have a higher platelet count in ET than those that are JAK2 positive. Patients with uh, Cal R are likely to have a slightly lower hemoglobin than those with JAK2. They're likely to have a slightly lower white cell count than those with JAK2. And I think most importantly, they're likely to have a lower risk for vascular complications. Now this matters a great deal when you're talking about a disease that you're going to live with, right? You're going to live with it for many, many years. And so the risks to that disease, and we'll talk about these, are vascular risks, most likely risks from the blood vessels of the abdomen, the legs or the lungs, the veins, or blood vessels of the heart those, and the brain, the arteries. And so the risk to blood clots in those areas is lower in individuals with Cal R positive disease than people with JAK2 positive disease. It doesn't seem like when you look at some of the most frightening, rare, but frightening um, things that happen to individuals with ET, transformation to myelofibrosis or leukemia, it doesn't seem to matter if you have CalR or JAK2 in terms of that. And again, these are retrospective studies. This doesn't mean it's not a prophecy, but it says when you look at large groups of people with these types of mutations, this is the behavior. So as Dr. Gottlieb rec uh, talked about, the recent recommendations on how to classify people of ET now take these mutations into effect. Until about a year ago, a year and a half ago, we used to think of ET in two baskets. The first basket was if you were under 60, you'd never had a clot, and your platelets were less than 1.5 million, you were in the low risk basket. If you were in the high risk basket, if you were over 60, if you'd had a prior history of a blood clot, either in the blood veins or the arteries, or if your platelets were over 1.5 million, that puts you in the high risk basket. That was before. There's been an evolution using these molecular markers that we've just been talking about, and we now have four categories. And this is a repeat for what Dr. Gottlieb said, but I just, I think it's really important in ET. So you have a very low risk category. Those people are under 60, well, under 61. They are negative for JAK2, 
and they've never had a blood clot either in their vein or their artery. Those people are in a very low risk category. There's a low risk category now and those people are, have never had a clot. They're under, they're under the age of 61, but they're positive for JAK2. Now, the difference between low risk and very low risk is this JAK2 mutation, and that's because we know this group has a higher risk of vascular events, which are the most common complication of people with ET. There's an intermediate risk group of people who are older, but have never had a clot and are negative for JAK2, these are folks that under the prior would be considered high risk and now are in this intermediate risk category. And then there's a high risk category. So as soon as someone has a blood clot, either a vein or an artery, a stroke, um, a pulmonary embolism, uh, abdominal vein clot in their spleen, or once they hit the age of 60 and have JAK2, then we now consider them in the higher risk category. Now again, these aren't magic. Within each of these, there's room for individual patient-doctor dis patient decision-making. We call that shared decision-making. And that's because we don't have enough people to know exactly the right thing to do every time. So a lot of this is about discussion. But this helps you understand a little bit about what risk the disease is posing to you before you take on risk of treatment. So this tells you that in individuals with a very low risk, the yearly risk for a blood clot, and this is a thrombosis in the arteries or veins, is between, um, it's, you get about 0.4 to 0.6 patients per year. You can see this goes up to 2.5 to 4%. So even when you're talking about the higher group, higher risk group, the risk of thrombosis is not extreme, okay? So my patient, Again, a young woman meets to discuss her case, and we discuss that the most common problems she's going to have are risks for bleeding and clotting, and she wants to know what she should do to prevent this. So we talk again about arterial clotting, and that includes heart attacks and strokes. Strokes are where their blood vessel to the brain blocks up, and we're talking ischemic stroke here usually, and that means the blood can't get there. Part of the oxygen is of the, to the brain is deprived, and that can affect your, that's the, what a stroke is. In the heart, it's the same thing. You have a plaque, and the blood vessels that supply the heart can't get the blood there, and part of the heart dies off. These are more common in people because sometimes they have elevated red blood cell count. That's not her case. More likely in ET is elevated white blood cell count, and that causes inflammation. So this inflammation in the blood vessels that supply the heart, this plaque, is higher in the case of white blood cells. It also just means that the interaction between the blood and the blood vessel, as it goes along here, is more challenged. And finally, certain mutations cause it. So there are things that she's in control of. She's not in control of her age. Unfortunately, we have yet to figure that one out. Um, but she certainly can avoid smoking. She can keep her total cholesterol down and her good cholesterol up. She can avoid carbohydrates or high levels of carbohydrates or sugar, which can cause diabetes. She can keep her blood pressure under control, keep her activity level up, and keep her weight down. So these things might seem like, well, yeah, sure. But I'll tell you, these things have an incredibly important effect on the heart and the brain and the blood vessels. So it's, it's, the effect they have may be much more important than whether or not you should take interferon or hydrea. So again, cardiac risk factors are absolutely essential for folks with these diseases. If you look at a 60-year-old man, for example, that's not our patient, but if he has cholesterol of 210, good cholesterol of 30, and a blood pressure of 140 over 70 and smokes, his risk of heart attack in 10 years is 23%. Now that's not somebody who has ET or PV, right? That's just regular, all right? That's going to be amplified with ET. If he stops smoking, d diets to reduce his cholesterol by 30 points and his blood pressure to 17, his risk drops by 10% um, just by those interactions. And it shows you that the leverage and the impact in the risk of this disease is under your control to some extent as long as you maximize these things. In case anybody wants it, you can go to the AHA and do a little calculator for yourself. And it doesn't include your MPN, but it's online. And it can calculate your risk of stroke or heart attack over the next P 
period of time by putting in some specific information that you might have. This, these kind of calculators, I think, could be helpful to tell you, indeed, that you do have some control. These are normal blood pressure targets. Again, we used to try and keep people under 140. We're now really aiming for less than 120 for that first number, the systolic number, and the diastolic less than 80. This is something that you talk with your hematologist about, but you also need to keep your primary doctor in the loop. They're often much better than somebody like me at controlling blood pressure, but it is essential. So complete abstinence from smoking, heart healthy eating program, that just means fruits and vegetables, high grains, low fat. Just remember things like sugars, uh, high carbohydrate meals, lots of fats. Those should be treats, not part of your regular thing. That should be on the periphery of your normal diet. And you want to keep your body mass index between 18 and 24. This is a calculator for that. You can sort of see where obese is. And you can, again, get this online just to calculate your own BMI and keep yourself in a healthy range. Cholesterol. We don't need to spend too much time on this, but there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Targets are a little complicated to generalize for the group, but I do think you should talk with your PCP about that because there is good ways to lower your cholesterol. And again, this makes a huge impact on your vascular risk, as does exercise. Exercise may, and we're going to hear a little bit about this in exercise and fatigue, but it may help just 30 minutes five to seven times a week. What about venous clots? These are clots in your legs, in your lungs. In the legs, it's often called a DVT or a VTE, and in the lungs, it's called a pulmonary embolism. They can also frighteningly occur in the stomach, in the brain drainage. Those are much more vicious and more dangerous. If you have a headache that doesn't go away, uh, migraines, those are things that need to be, blood clots in the veins, can def or in the veins of the brain can definitely happen, and we need to be careful about those. So if you have one of those clots, then you're automatically in the high-risk category. And that's because we know, even though your percentage might be low, your body has a tendency to do that. And so the initial treatment for that is getting your disease under control. You want to be on blood thinning medicines. Um, and we don't really know how long you stay on those, but often indefinitely. Now, also, people need to think about the time of surgery. People with uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms around get, and who are having surgery, like a hip replacement or a knee replacement, are at high risk for clots after those surgeries. So you want your doctor and your orthopedist or your surgeon to talk together. And you may need to be on blood, um, blood thinning medicines after surgery for not, this is a mistake, it's not three to six months, it's if you've never had a clot, it's three to six weeks. But you want to think about extended treatment for abdominal clots, et cetera. And you usually pause aspirin when you're on a blood thinner, although you should talk about that with your doctor because there's plus minuses about that. I don't want to make a huge um, statement about that. There is new information that the direct oral anticoagulants, the so-called DOACs, which are replacing warfarin, may be safe in our treatment population. So if you're on warfarin, you can talk to your hematologist just about switching, if you want to, to one of the newer medicines. What about bleeding? So bleeding can actually occur in patients with ET with a very high platelet count, for example, over 1.5 million. And it's typically called mucocutaneous bleeding, which means your gums or your hemorrhoids, your nose bleeds, not so much joint bleeds. And this is called acquired von Willebrand's disease. And it happens because in the normal blood vessel, you've got platelets and white blood cells. But in a, when you have too many platelets, and you also have these things here, which are some of your clotting proteins right here. If you have too many platelets, what happens is they all glom up and make those clotting proteins not work. So it doesn't seem, it seems weird that you would have nor high platelets and yet a bleeding problem, but it does happen and it seems to be associated with very high rates, high levels of platelets. So back to our clinical case, we discuss her clotting and bleeding risks. We discuss her arterial and venous clotting risks and what she can do to control it. And then we talk about treatment. Why does she feel tired? What's happening to her feet? What about this miscarriage for her? Turns out people with ET, like other MPNs, can certainly feel tired. There's a whole range of symptoms that go along with these diseases. And the symptoms are a little bit different in men versus women. 
females have a lower rate of thrombocytopenia, higher rates of fatigue, and higher rates of these microvascular symptoms, which can include migraines and the condition that she has, which is called erythromyalgia, pain in the feet or sometimes in the hands that can be quite severe at time with warmth and redness. There's also differences between men and women with regard to fertility. She and I talked a little bit about the fact that her disease means she can't be on oral contraception, and that's because hormones increase the risk of clots in people with myeloproliferative neoplasms. And so I avoid oral contraceptions in any patient with ET, and I also avoid um, postmenopausal hormone replacement, again, because of this same risk. Sometimes people in postmenopausal can use local therapies like um, lubricants or uh, estrogen uh, suppositories for dys um, dyspernia after menopause. Pregnancy is very complicated. Some estimates um, indicate that the live birth rate can be as uh, decreased by 30 to 40 percent, and late pregnancy loss occur in 10 percent. But a recent study, luckily in the UK, indicated that that might have been a little bit of overestimation and that the miscarriage and perinatal rates may be much lower than we thought. Partially that may be because we're doing a better job of guiding these patients through pregnancy with aspirin and sometimes uh, blood thinner, and part of it may be because the priors were impacted by differences in diagnostics. So her question is, should I be on medicine? And we talk again about the risk that she faces. And the question is, should she be on medicine because, one, she's had a miscarriage? Does that count as a clot, which would put her in a high-risk category and mean she needs to be anticoagulated? Two, should she, be, should she go on blood thinners or she, should she go on treatment because her platelets are 1.2 million? She's not having bleeding. I test her for von Willebrands. But she's worried that her platelets are 1.2 million. Or three, should she go on blood thinners because of her treatment, because of her erythromyalgia, this pain in her feet? So this gets to a point where this is a complicated case. This is a young woman. I'd prefer not to start her on treatment if I don't have to. I have, um, she doesn't want to start treatment if she doesn't have to. However, she has three reasons to think about it. And this is where I get to uh, shared decision making. There's no rule that says whether or not this miscarriage that she had seven years ago, where I don't know her blood counts, was related to her ET. I don't know if I should count that as a thrombosis or not. Um, the main thing that's impacting her life, actually, is this erythromyalgia. She works as a docent. She's on her feet a lot. And this is relatively disabling. She's thinking about changing her job. So when I sat down and talked about her, I said, the only reason I think we should think about it is this erythromyalgia, and maybe we can get it better without having to put you on something like cytoreduction. So the, this, again, talks about treatment. If we don't consider her, throm her prior miscarriage to be a thrombosis, she's in a very low risk category, very low risk. She's CalR positive. She's young. And if we think that that miscarriage doesn't count, then she could be observed alone and take aspirin if she has cardiovascular risks, and I monitor her for the acquired von Willebrand's disease. If she, we think of that, at that, uh, if we think that that miscarriage counted as a clot, then I have to put her on aspirin and cytoreductive therapy. So that's why we think about it and we go through it. It's a difficult decision, but what we decided in this patient was just to try and treat her erythromyalgia without putting her on it. We, um, I didn't put her on aspirin because her platelet count was too high, but I read somewhere about this compounded midodrine, um, and we tried that on her feet. And we also tried gabapentin, and we tried low-dose antidepressants, all of which have had some effectiveness in this. And we tried this between six to eight months, going back and forth on this, and unfortunately, we were not able to get her erythromyalgia under control. She needed to, she was thinking about quitting her job because every day she'd have two hours of this pain. So then we decided, well, maybe we need to decrease your platelet count and see if that helps. We talked about hydrea. Uh, hydrea shows that patients in this condition prevent, it prevents blood clots, both venous and arterial. It causes all your blood counts to decrease. 
And the toxicities include skin cancers, sun sensitization. It's very dangerous if you're going to try and get pregnant, or if you do get pregnant on this, it causes toxicity to the fetus. It can cause some ankle problems, including these ulcers, and it can sometimes cause liver problems. We also talked about interferon. This was a medicine she would need to inject. It would be taken once a week. There's a randomized study that's ongoing, Dr. Gottlieb talked about, and the early results demonstrate there's equivalency between of these. It causes your blood counts to go down, and it can worsen depression. Um, and so that's also, those were the side effects we talked about. I talked about a medicine called anagrelide, which is a pill. This is usually used only if people don't respond to hydrea or interferon. It affects only the platelets, but it has some toxicities, including fast heart rate and heart strain. It can cause lung problems, and it can cause some headaches. And finally, she asked about this medicine she'd heard about called ruxolitinib. This was recently um, looked at in patients who had essential thrombocythemia and who'd failed hydrea, meaning their disease had gotten worse with hydrea. All of these people were in the high-risk category. Half got ruxolitinib, half got what's called best available therapy, meaning whatever else they could, including some of them got interferon, some of them got hydrea. The, it turns out that the rates of what they call complete remission and partial remission, which really means are the blood counts controlled, were equivalent. Both arms had some response to their symptoms. The RUX, the litanive patients had a deeper symptom relief, and that relief lasted longer. But in the end, the conclusions of the authors of this study was that ruxolitinib is not better compared to other options in people in this category. Although the symptom responses were su superior, there was no difference in the control of blood counts, transformation, thrombosis, or hemorrhage. So while ruxolitinib is in the mix for second-line ET, it doesn't necessarily better than anagrelide or interferon. So in this case, we tried the gabapentin, we tried the topical midodrine. She had some significant menorrhagia as well, and we decided to start interferon therapy. She started on 45 micrograms a week, and she said it was remarkable that her foot and leg pain went down quite a bit as her platelets went down. At 90 mig micrograms a week, her platelets fell to 450,000. Her symptoms of depression were well controlled. She was seeing a therapist who I was in contact with, and I talked about the interferon on the risk of depression, and she is continuing on the interferon at that time. So that's my clinical case. I think we've gone through some of the basics, why it's important to have diagnosis, what you think about risk stratification, and how you choose treatments. And what I would argue is that ET is a disease where you have to converse a lot with your doctor about why I'm doing what I'm doing, what are the risks of the treatment, and what are the risks of the disease, and constantly weigh them back and forth. We should have new medicines for this disease over time, but they're going to filter in slowly. Um, hopefully, as things, um, as we learn more about it, we'll have m new novel medicines to treat symptoms without affecting the stem cell. Thank you.